Okay, this is one of the final sessions for the Working Legally and Ethical Unit, although it's got content that will contribute to other units as well. You might come across this lesson embedded into some other spaces. There's a new learning requirement in this unit compared to if you'd done this last year. And it's quite a good one. It's about asking you to access, interpret and evaluate legal and ethical resources. It's basically saying that I can teach you all about the law as it stands right here, right now, and in two years' time that's going to be kind of useless to you because you don't know how much of it's changed. So the point of today's session is for you to be able to know how to go find it for yourself. So there was actually an assessment task related to this, assessment task five. Go look on the e-learn and you'll find it. But essentially what we're looking at is how are you going to know? When you look stuff up on the, online or in any other place, how will you know whether it's good stuff or rubbish stuff? And how are you going to find it as quickly and as effectively as possible? I'll walk you through the process, um, looking at an ethical dilemma that we looked at last week as to how I would go about that. Because I've had to do a lot of that in the last 12 months. I came from interstate. Most of these laws are state-based. So I know New South Wales law and what to expect. But you come to the ACT, it's a little different. I've done my best to show you guys both New South Wales and ACT laws and rules because I figured that a lot of our clients are going to cross the borders. But there'll be new laws come in. There'll be you perhaps moving into state. There'll be talk of different things at different times. That's what this is about. And you'll find some complete and utter garbage being discussed on the internet. And it's useful for you to be able to say, yeah, OK, let's take a look at this in reality. If you're in New South Wales, it's actually really easy. Go to your library and it's there. The State Library has made a point of having a legal toolkit with a stack of different legal resources that they try to keep up to date in every public library across the state. <coughs> the ACT hasn't done that. But they do have, yeah, some useful stuff there, um, including what they call hot topics. When refugees were the big topic of the day, they put out a specific magazine that said, here's what the difference is between a refugee and an asylum seeker, here's what the law is, here's what the law isn't, here's some of the myths, for example. And, or they also did it on drug law or various other child protection, various other areas that are being reformed. <coughs> By the way, one of the other massive resources that is so very underlooked, but it is an absolute mine that's worth checking out, is not just your local library, but your local librarian. These are incredibly helpful people. If you just ask, they know how to find stuff. They've got access to databases that you and I don't. They've got access to all sorts of things. You can also get the Law Handbook online, but it's, it used to be put out by... Redfin Legal Centre, I understand that that may have changed. It's been going for a long time now. It's been around, it's up to its, I don't know, probably 13th edition. It's put out every two years and I recommend if you're in a workplace in New South Wales that you buy a copy. It costs something like 80 bucks, so you get your organisation to buy a copy. But also, and this is the tricky bit, you've got to train them to say, in two years' time, we need to throw that out now. Because it's a really nice looking book, it's bound, it's about an inch thick, and you need to be able to say, when I go to the law book, I want to be able to rely on it. We need the latest copy and we need to throw out the old copy. That's New South Wales law. That's New South Wales law. It, it includes federal law as well, but actually goes for that principle of the law that says it should be fair, easy and accessible. We'll take a look at it later because it is online. <coughs> Through a bit of internet magic, the State Library has made it available section by section. 13th edition, there we go. Put out every two years, so it's been going now for at least 26 years constantly updated. They used to actually put out, and if you're registered, they'd actually give you a, a, an addition for the year in between, just a little supplement to, to say here's what's changed in the last little while. <coughs> okay, for the rest of us, we're going to have to look up the internet. <coughs> I think a lot of what I'm going to tell you, you're going to think, I already know how to use Google. How many people have heard of Google? Yeah, but ma many of you. <laughs> I mean, if you didn't put your hand up, you're either lazy or you're 
So out of touch. This is called a computer. <laughs> okay, so you would know. You can search. Let me give you some of the basics because some of it will be basic but there will be probably some surprises that you don't know as the lesson goes on. Let's take a look at the URLs. Web addresses, universal resource locators if you're into using big words where you could just use a little one. The very first part of a URL is HTTP. Does anybody know what that's about? Yeah, it's the language that the internet uses. If you, if you really must know, hypertext transfer protocol. <coughs> we can pretty much ignore that. In fact, modern browsers will, you can just type in the, the rest of the URL and the browser software doesn't demand that you type in HTTP colon forward slash forward slash, but it's there. The useful bit to us is sometimes you can look at it and you can see HTTPS, which means it's a secure site. Depending on your browser, you might see a little padlock. That means that it's got, usually it's got a password access or it's got your account you've logged into, whether you know it or not. Check Facebook. Next time you look at it, it'll have probably a little padlock or HTTPS to tell you that it's a secure site. It's encrypted. Uh, cleverer people than me put it into code as it leaves and receives from the server. We can ignore that end. Let's focus on this end. This is the useful part to us. It's what we call the bottom level domain. After the last dot, um, it typically indicates what country that website is based in. So .uk is a United Kingdom website. .ru is a Russian website. I'd keep away from them. They seem to be tending towards the dodginess. .au means that when you see that at the end of a web address, it's an Australian based website. The way it all happened was it was developed, all these protocols were developed in the United States. And it was almost like an add-on to think, oh yeah, other countries might need this as well. So there's no actual .us that I know of. Or well, there is, but it's barely used. Because by default, .com, .net, .whatever, by default is seen as a US-based website. That causes problems because people like to have a web address that just sends in .com. It sounds more like that's the official one. So that's a lot of organisations skip that. They might be an Australian organisation, but they'll skip straight to getting a .com. But for now, we can say, if it ends in .au, it's an Australian website. If it ends in .nz, it's a website based in New Zealand. So Google's Australian website is google.com.au, whereas Google's Chinese website is google.com.cn. It's mostly the same, although apparently the Chinese one will screen some things out. And Google's US website is just plain google.com. Not a lot of difference. It does have the option to say search just from Australia if you use the Australian one. And there's one or two other things behind the scenes. But that gives you a picture. Google is just an example here. It's not important to know Google's different ones. It's important to know top level domain, Point one, dot com dot au means Australian. Now, in Australia, the second level domain, that's between the last dot and the dot before that, traditionally tells you what type of website it was. The plan was that everything would be logically placed into one of these spaces. I'll go through them all one by one in a moment. But these are the second level domains within Australia. The .gov.au sites are the governments and their departments. These are the most reliable ones. If we're going to be going, because our focus is on the law, if we're going to be going looking for legal info, that's the good stuff. That's the stuff where the government knows it would be pretty negligent of them to keep stuff up on their website that's out of date. So we're going to search for those in particular. CSIRO.au, you're rarely going to see it. It's also very, very reliable, but you're not going to see it that much. It's got lots of data. It's, it flies over my head. 
my head. And you're really going to see it very research driven. When we're talking about the law, it's not going to come into our world at all very much. But I thought I'd tell you about it. .edu.au are the educational institutions. Again, these are pretty reliable. Pretty reliable. Um, they do lots of research, they do produce lots of information, but sometimes it can be students' work or it can be blogs or it can be opinions. So we just need to watch that, yes, it tends to be the official universities or schools' websites with that .edu.au. They're valuable things, but we've got to watch it. Individual schools, colleges and universities have a bit of a protocol for the third level domains. So I'm not sure how visible that is to you there, but schools.nsw.edu.au, each individual school has their own website, so you can tell when something has that in it. It's come from Katoomba High or Katoomba Primary. Check the H and the P. Um, the primary schools, Melbourne Girls Grammar, um, and, and the different universities will have their different space. So CRT is crt.edu.au. I'm a little surprised, I've got to say, when I first came here that it wasn't crt.act.edu.au. Somehow we scored that and it's simpler for all of us. But those are the standard protocols. I can tell at a glance that that is a Victorian grammar school, even though it's a private school. So yeah, just letting you know, that exists. The next up, the most common are going to be the .com.au and the dot, a little bit less common, .net.au. .com is short for commercial. In the US it's just plain .com for everything, or .net. In Australia it's .com.au, .net.au. These are the most common, but we've got to think about the reliability of them. You've got to filter them through these three questions. Let's take a look at the questions one by one. Is it really the company that you think it is? Because I can go out tomorrow and I can register a website, if it isn't already taken, in the name of an organisation. So I could, I haven't looked recently, I could probably get um, canberrainstituteoftechnology.com.au because it's a very long URL, it probably hasn't already been booked. I could get that and I could set up a website that pretends to be Canberra Institute of Technology, but it's not. It's just me being mischievous. And there's nothing to stop me from doing that, except that I'd lose my job. But besides that, um, so the White House. Dot, so I'm going to looking at some American ones here. Whitehouse.gov, Whitehouse.net, Whitehouse.org are all valid URLs, but only one of them is the actual government website. And you've all been paying attention, so you would know that it's the .gov one. But these guys here, you click onto it and you think, oh cool, I've reached the White House, but there's really weird stuff being said about Barack Obama here. That's because it's a parody website. Somebody has set it up to pretend. So you've just got to be careful that what appears to be the real one isn't so much. So is it really who you think it is? Is it a reliable source? So martinlutherking.org, you go to that and you think, cool, kids do it all the time, especially in America. They're going to look up about Martin Luther King. They read all sorts of stuff about how he slept around and how he's a terrorist and how he was a racist and how all sorts of stuff. Stormfront, which is a neo-Nazi organisation in the US, booked that website. So they own it and they run it. Um, the KingCenter.org is the real Martin Luther King Centre. MartinLutherKing.org at first glance looks like the real deal. Um, some IHR, Institute for Historic Review, <coughs> sounds, like a, sounds like a historic organisation, it sounds kind of good. It's a Holocaust denial history website, so it'll have lots of history, including the fact that 
all those Jews, they're just whinging, it never really happened. Well, it wasn't as bad as they made out. Can't they take a joke? Stuff like that. So they're biased, they're inaccurate, but they appear to be the genuine deal. So is it the really the company? Is it really a reliable source? And a good question is always, what's the incentive of these people to have set up this website in the first place? I've already told you about a couple. Um, Cafe Herpy. Dot com, everything you wanted to know about genital herpes but you were afraid to ask. All sorts of useful info there. And it all seems to always suggest that you go to GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceuticals and use their products because they set it up. They set it up as an information site that guides people towards their stuff. Um, the Australian Environment Foundation it's not a dot com, but as an example, it seems like a genuine, like you hear that, Australian Environment Foundation, that sounds like a greenie group. Um, it's actually an anti-greenie group. It's a, sorry, it's an alternative environmental group, um, <coughs> which has a, a political incentive for putting up all sorts of info that says wind farms are no good, solar farms are no good, Nuclear is not as bad as people think it is. Yeah, fossil fuels, they've been, been given a hard time. So it's an interesting website in that it appears to be... Oh, at first glance, you've got to screen things to see just how neutral they're being. That's an entire organisation, that's a rare one. It's an entire organisation set up contrary to the existing environmental world. So yeah, look at those three questions. Is it really who you think it is? Um, is the company or site a reliable one? What's the incentive for the info you've got? Is it politically motivated? Is it commercially motivated? Because that means you're going to have to filter this stuff. That's with all the dot coms and the dot net, oh sorry, dot com dot au, dot net dot au sites. .org.au and .asn.au, which is, the ASN is, it's pretty rare. These are organisations, these are probably, when you go out to your workplace, what your organisation will have if it's not a government one. These are for associations and not-for-profit organisations. That was the plan. This is what they're all supposed to be used for. My name's David Smith. It's a pretty common name. Don't know if you've noticed. DavidSmith.com has taken, been taken. DavidSmith.com.au has been taken. David Smith, all sorts of different David Smith variations. But I could, if I wanted to throw down 20 bucks, and perhaps one day I will, reserve the name DavidSmith.net.au. Now, originally that was supposed to be for people who are actually running the net, but I could just walk in and grab it. Um, I could just grab in David, David H. Smith, perhaps, to keep with CRT's naming protocol, dot .asn. It's become a bit more flexible, but you do need to show, if you're getting one of these, that you're a not-for-profit. But it doesn't sound like it's hard at all to do that. So, look, I'd say they're a little reliable, but again, you've got this whole... Is it really who you think it is? Is it reliable? What's the incentive? But certainly a lot of our organisations in particular are going to be .org.au. Tell at a glance, that's a not-for-profit organisation. Does anybody know the difference between an association and an organisation? Not-for-profit organisation? Yeah, no, I don't know either. But apparently there's a difference to the people who set up this protocol. The last one is id.au. I've never seen it. I do know that dave.id is gone. Would have been one of the first to go, probably. Smith, Dave, yeah, it's all gone. Um, what I've found when I've explored .id or .id.au's it's people putting together their resumes, it's people's own sales page, it's, it's your personal site. The, uh, the plan was originally that would be about not-for-profits, that would be about commercial, that would be about educational. This is personal individual sites. 
people just grab whatever, but that was always the plan. So I don't think you're going to see many of those. Be aware that they're kind of mixed in how reliable they are. But mostly you're going to be looking at .gov.au, government ones, .coms because they're so common, .edu.au's because it's educational and therefore a little bit, I'd, I'd rank it, pretty much ranking in the order I've got there is the further up the, 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 more, the less screens I would put up, the more reliable I would say they are. Okay, so in the US, the Google site says .com. It's a commercial site, but their not-for-profit section is google.org. To put that into practice to show you the difference. They have a huge not-for-profit section. It's fascinating to look at some of the stuff they're doing with solar, wind-powered, self-drive car robots that are going to take over the world. Or interesting stuff at .org as opposed to .com, which is their commercial site. So I can look at that and I can instantly tell that's an Australian site and it's a not-for-profit. I can instantly look at that and I should be able to tell that's an Australian site and it's a commercial one. And I can instantly look at that and I can say, not only is it Australian government, but it's probably federal government because it's not .nsw.gov.au, it's ato.gov.au, it's the Australian Tax Office, it's federal government. It doesn't have the state in between the, just before the .gov. And of course, after all of these domains, you have your individual pages, so forward slash, and there's a whole space there for all sorts of other files. I've just been focusing on this bit here with the docs. <coughs> After the forward slash there could be all sorts of things that tell you the, the file structure, where they file things and things. This is the key part. Dot index was actually a pretty bad example because by default if you go to ata.gov.au that will take you to their front page which is actually index or home. You just don't see it on the screen all that often. But it fitted nicely on the screen so that's the example I used. Now keep in mind that that was the plan, that was the original plan but people make their own rules. So Uniting, which is actually the new name for Uniting Care Australia, <coughs> They've chosen to just go with uniting.org because it's nice and short. Despite the fact that they're an Australian organisation, they chose that as their default web page just to confuse us. So be aware, there is a bit of flexibility there. But I guess I could say an Australian organisation chose to be .org. I can't really imagine an American association choosing to be .org.au. So that's sort of a one-way funnel towards the American. Sorry? That's unusual. What, that this happened or? <coughs> one-way funnel America. Yeah, who'd have guessed? <laughs> okay, so remember the Australian government has made third level domains for each state in both the .gov area and the .edu area. So nsw.gov, Queensland.gov, ACT.gov. That's clearly a New South Wales website and not that useful to us. Because remember we're looking at the law, it varies a lot from one state to the next. We're going to be wanting not that one either. Community.nsw.gov.au. Useful if you're crossing the border. Might have some useful general information but don't rely on it for the law. <coughs> That's the federal one. So we can take a look at a website and we can say certain things haven't come up on the screen. Here we go. Lawhandbook.sa.gov.au. It's an Australian government website. This is really cool. It's reliable. It's an entire law handbook with all of the laws in it. We can use that. But only if we're in South Australia. 
otherwise it's got all sorts of useful legal stuff and we need to filter. So is it talking about the federal law, in which case that's cool. Is it talking about this? Let's just ignore it, shall we? It looked good at first glance, but we can tell by looking at the URL, it's not for us. Let's take a look at another one. Legaladvice.com.au so again, you can look at that and you can say it's got lots of useful legal information, all different states, all sorts of civil liv, litigation, commercial litigation, business law, cool. But you're all observant people, you'll be able to look at the website and you'll be able to say it's Australian, that's good, but it's commercial, so what is their motivation? And in fact, yeah, it is, it's for profit. They're, the general disclaimer is our, the reason we're giving you all this is to help you find a legal practitioner. We're basically a great big advertising website to help you. We want, to be the, we want you to rely on us and our information so that we can funnel you towards a lawyer who's paying us for that referral. Now I don't doubt for a moment that that would be fairly relevant and reliable because what sort of a moron would have a legal website and not keep it up to date? They're very, very liable and they're lawyers and they would know that. So it's almost certainly up to date, but be aware that their advice is always going to be, yeah, you should talk to a professional. Would you like us to find one for you? Here's our directory. That is ultimately their motivation. But like I said, not many legal companies would would do that and leave stuff out of date. But we need to filter. Okay, so having looked at all of that, there'll be some websites you know are reliable. I might have mentioned some of these two before. I've looked at both New South Wales, ACT and Australia wide, but these are ones that we just plain know. Australia wide, Australian Oh, sorry, Australasian Legal Information Institute. Have I mentioned this one before? Yes, okay, some people don't remember. It's the site that has got every law, every piece of case law, every court decision, everything dating way back, decades. Lots of stuff, very plain text. Lawyers love this one. You've got to mention. Yeah, when we had a lawyer come to visit us as it's there, it's legislation, it's common law, it's not plain English, but it's there every now and then you're gonna to have to dig down and actually look at the individual laws. It's sort of the number one resource. Because um, it's hard to read. The government has started saying we'd like to get in on that action too, so they have set up legislation dot insert your state dot gov .au, the actual legislation for each state or comlaw dot gov .au for the Commonwealth. Again, <coughs> it could be plainer English. It is the actual laws themselves in PDF format, if that makes a difference to you. So one big PDF document rather than a series of web pages. Pros and cons either way. But it's there when we're talking about the actual legislation itself. From memory, I don't think these guys actually have the common law. So that's the benefit of the Ostley site. This is just the legislation. But you can look at individual government departments. So workcover.nsw.gov.au, industrialrelations.nsw.gov.au, especially their webpage within that forward slash awards, community.nsw, housing.fairtrading.whatever. These are really valuable sites. Government departments make a point of keeping their information up to date. That's a lot more plain English. It's more like they've interpreted the law and put in the plain English and given us lots of extra valuable stuff as well. So that's a couple of useful ones for you. For New South Wales, for the ACT, um, communityservices.act.gov.au is going to tell you. That would be the place I'd go to if I wanted to know about child protection laws here. Because you're getting it directly from the department themselves.
Centrelink is interesting. No, Centrelink is boring as they all come, but interesting in that Centrelink.gov.au will tell you here's what your, the rules are regarding welfare from the perspective of the government themselves. So it could be that in a moment I'll show you a website of a non-government mob, Welfare Rights Centre, who will tell you what Centrelink has to say, but they'll also say, here's the stuff that Centrelink don't want you to know. So sometimes there's a benefit to not looking at the government site because maybe the government has their own particular, here's how we would like you to be. No, here's what we want you to know, as opposed to here's all this other stuff that exists as well. Oh, so the Attorney General site also takes you to a range of other websites as well. So go to ag.gov.au and it's got a whole list of other links. Now you will remember from a previous class when I taught you about negligent misstatement which is negligently giving out bad information. <coughs> You can be sued, plus it's really bad for your clients to get false information anyway. So a really good attitude to take is some really plain language websites for our clients, for us to sit side by side with our clients, for them to know how to look this stuff up themselves. You're empowering them. You're not giving any advice. You're saying, according to these guys, here's what it says. Take a look on the screen. We're exploring this together. And it's really empowering for them because they're getting to then see, ah, OK, here's how you look it up. Maybe there's one of these other topics that I might want to look up when the worker's not around. Because I'm just curious. So legalaid.org.au will give you a link to the Youth Law Matters book that they put out. It's just a couple of years old but it's legal aid, it's a reputable organisation, I would trust them. It's youth focused, but what it has to say transfers over to everybody else as well. In New South Wales, the shopfront.org, and again, interestingly, they chose not to do the .au at the end. They wanted to keep it nice and short. That's a New South Wales youth legal centre. And it has a specific section, if you take a look on their page, that says information for workers. And it's got a whole string of documents on common offences, different stuff you'd have to deal with. These guys have a shop front in, Sydney, in a city working with homeless young people. So they, are constant, they know what the issues are for that particular crowd. It's a good website. And the, what I love about the shop front is in their info for workers, they've dated everything. So it actually says last updated 2004, last updated 2010. So you can, you can check. If you've heard about new laws, you can check that their stuff is up to date. I mentioned the library already. A massive amount of stuff there, tenants' rights and various others. Again, plain English, easy for your client to access, easy for your client to read. And the website there. I'll give you a quick look at it in a moment when I'm not recording as to what that looks like. This one, again, you've heard me mention it before, law stuff. <coughs> And I may have mentioned before, sitting down beside my client looking at this, we might be in particularly interested in what the law is about school. And I've avoided giving my client any info about the law and school because we've been able to explore this site. But nine out of ten times my clients have looked at this list and gone, oh look, there's a bit about sexting, a bit about pregnancy, a bit about drugs and marriage and medical. I'm cur and you can just step aside and let them explore. Some interesting topics there, if that's who you are. And lawyers working for nothing. Yeah. It's, it's sort of both, but people, people hear the free lawyer bit, they don't hear the, it's actually supposed to be for the good of society. People can be very self-centred on that. Um, 
Now, all of these sites might not have been government sites, but they are reputable. They've got a good reputation they're trying to uphold, and they are Australian or even ACT. Same with these guys, Legal Aid ACT. I've mentioned already their Youth Law Matters book, but they're also useful for other information, and the ACT Law Society. Yes, you know, so it's one of the few ASN associations, websites. Hey, that it happened, but it's two quite different bodies. They both happen to be not-for-profits, they both happen to be in the welfare industry, and they both happen to have those same four letters as their acronym, but you want the right one. Okay, so a bunch of other legal services, local, reputable, we can use them. Taking attitude, we talked about those already. Um, peak bodies. So I think I've mentioned peak bodies to you before, but peak bodies are organisations that don't actually deliver services themselves, they support their members. So the Tenants' Union supports a whole stack of other tenants. Youth Coalition supports a whole stack of other youth services. They're not delivering youth services themselves, but they are supporting the youth network. And they often do that with legal advice. There's a stack of others. It's worth getting to know them. But again, they've got a reputation to hold up. So, like there's a lot of websites out there that people have kind of abandoned. They're out of date or they've got a motive. You can't really rely on them. I wouldn't say that about the peak bodies. They've got something they're needing to maintain. And the Tenants' Union is going to tell you different things than the official government site because there might be some things that the government aren't wanting to advertise, as an example. Welfare rights, again, um, this is actually a national one, not a New South Wales one. Welfare Rights Centre is going to tell you the stuff that Centrelink doesn't want to tell you but it's talking the same area. So looking at the two hand in hand is not a bad process. Centrelink will say, here's what we expect of everybody. Welfare Rights Centre will say, here's what they expect of everyone, but here's what they should be expecting of everyone. That's for every state. This one here is federal, that's right. These are New South Wales Tenants Union and the Youth Action and Policy Association. That may be a defunct website, I'll check that, but it's, it might now be youthaction.org.au because they have changed their name. Does um, anything that has policies and law and things like that on it, um, do they have to have like a, a, the last date it was updated? Do they have to actually? No, they don't. That, okay, so that's just by choice people put that as being yes. updated. So uh, the law itself, the legal websites, the, the government ones will always say, here's where the law came in. So that's why they're the most reliable. But no, there's other times that there's stuff that you think, I don't know how this is, so I don't know if I can rely on that. If I had a company or, or a body and um, I had a website, and on my website I had my pol our policies and that on yep. there, um, if I've still got that up there and the policy has changed, is there no implications at all? Is that what you're no, I'm not saying that at all. God, no. Um, if it's your own organisation's policy and you've published it and it's out of date, then I'd be forgiven for thinking that's still your policy and you screwed up by not telling me the updated policy. So I could legally and ethically say, but you told me it was this because it still says that on your website. Yeah. Now, you can argue, I oh, know I've updated it since then, it's like, okay, but you're still telling me today on your website that this is your policy. Therefore, you're acting a bit dodgy there. I just couldn't sort of define what you were saying before. You're sort of saying everyone can open up things. Yeah, there's, there's lots of websites that have been abandoned, that have been way out of date. Um, I've, I might even have a couple. People have forgotten about them for years. So, but if it's an organisation that's still valid, still running, then, yeah, it's, it's up to you to make sure that you keep that up to date because people are going to read that thinking that they know what the policy is and they'd be within their rights to think that's your current rule. Yes? 
Because I told you. Yeah, because I can. <laughs> yeah, that's the only way. Because it's not a standard thing. For the government and the, the .edu ones, they put in that third level domain. For the rest, you have to go there and look. And it can be an easy trap to fall into because lots of students in the past have said, when I said look up the law about this, they've shown me American sites, they've shown me interstate sites. That's why I'm telling you this now, is you've got to be a... Okay, so we've started to look at the relevant websites that you can look at. Remember the .gov that I use? We're going to look at interpreting the law and looking at individual acts and case laws to, to delve into that in a little bit more depth in just a moment.